Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to our Sing Health Ukraine US Head and Neck Center public webinar for today. It is uh, presented to you as part of the World Head and Neck uh, Cancer Awareness Day. Today's session is on oral and tongue cancers. My name is Dr. Shimon Mikulski, and uh, our program today consists of uh, five parts. Uh, first, we have the welcome address, followed by three segments by our specialists. And at the end, there'll be a Q&A session for you to uh, get your questions answered. Um, first, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Constance Thiel, who is the head and senior consultant in the Sing Health uh, Duke and US Head and Neck Center, as well as Singapore General Hospital's Otorhinolaryngology Unit and the Division of Surgery and Cent Surgical Oncology at um, the National Cancer Center to give our welcome address. Uh, Dr. Constance Thiel, please. Give me a second. Yeah. All right. Good morning, everyone. Hi. Uh, I noticed that there's some questions from uh, the, our participants who say that the uh, sound is a bit questionable. Um, I hope it's okay now. Yeah. So, anyway, welcome to the webinar. Um, we are very happy to have all of you this morning on a Saturday morning. So, oral cancer is really uh, on, and ulcers are actually very common. And I'm sure that all of you are here because you're wondering, you know, when should you worry? And, and is it cancer? And if it's cancer, what can be done? If it's, in, in, you know, and how will you be after that? Can you still talk? Can you still eat? There's probably a lot of concerns. And we hope that we can address that uh, today. So um, at the Sing Health Duke NS Head and Neck Center, we um, aim not only to cure our patients, but we also hope to give them the best uh, functional outcomes after their treatment. And that's why today we have gathered here um, a team, uh, not only surgeons, but also our speech therapists, uh, Ms. Alberto Do, and we will be going into some things that we could help our patients as well as our uh, plastic surgeon, who helps us a lot with uh, you know, reconstructing you know, some of these cases. Um, and I think last uh, but not least is actually all of you, um, patients, family, friends of patients, public, you know, that I think we hope that this uh, webinar will be useful to empower you with some uh, information, either to seek treatment early, uh, you know, and not wait, because I think the, the outcomes are much better if you come early to see us and we get it treated. And also, if you happen to have family and friends uh, that uh, are going through the process, Hopefully, this will help you a little bit more to understand and support them along the way. So I think uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over uh, the stage to the team here. Yep. Thank you. Uh, our first speaker today um, presenting on oral ulcers and uh, oral cancer will be, will be Dr. Rahul Nagadia, who is a consultant at the Department of Head and Neck Surgery in Singapore General Hospital, as well as National Cancer Center Singapore, as well as National Dental uh, uh, Center Singapore. Um, Dr. Rahul will give a presentation uh, now. So Rahul, go ahead. Thanks, Shimon. Uh, I'll just share my screen in a minute. Can everyone see my screen now? Yes. All right. Thanks, Dr. Constance Dio, and thanks, Shimon, for the kind introduction. Welcome, everyone, to our session aimed to increase awareness of head and neck cancers. Uh, thanks for joining us on a weekend morning. In this talk on oral cancer, I hope to answer some of your queries on when we should be concerned about oral ulcers and when to seek professional help. I have no financial disclosures. So oral cancers or oral SCCs as they are known are the seventh most common cancer in the world. The incidence varies quite widely across different regions. The highest rate of oral cancers can be seen in Southeast Asian countries like India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. Countries like Taiwan also have disproportionately higher incidence of oral cancer. And this is attributed to the common practice of chewing betel nut in Taiwan. Though these cancers are not in the top three, they are associated with poor survival outcomes, especially in patients who have various risk factors and or who are diagnosed at a very advanced stage. In some cases, the fiber 
five-year survival rate can be as low as 50%. The structure of oral cavity and the organs that it is composed of um, help with basic functions like chewing, swallowing, and speech. Understandably, when these structures are damaged due to cancer or due to result of extensive resective surgery, these vital functions may be affected. Patients may face difficulty in chewing regular normal diet. They may be dependent on feeding via tubes, or they may have to change the consistency of their diet, or they might have to use aids to help them with swallow. Sometimes patients have difficulty articulating certain words, thus affecting the quality of their life. The major issue with cancers in head and neck region is that they may be detected only at a late stage. Early lesions may not have any symptoms and may not be easily visible in the complex anatomy of the oral cavity. So before we look at these abnormal lesions, let us try and understand what normal oral cavity looks like. So oral cavity starts from our lips to the soft palate and on the top, it goes from our heart palate to the tongue and the floor of mouth. Within these oral cavity, we have teeth and their supporting structures like gums and the underlying bone. A young healthy person should have at least 28 teeth, 32 if the wisdom teeth are not taken out. These teeth should be free of decay or infection or any sharp edges. The skin, and I say that in inverted commas, of the oral cavity is called as mucosa. This mucosa should be moist, it should appear pink and healthy, and it should be intact. The gums or the gingiva should not be swollen or infected. There should be no pus or blood or any discharge. There should not be any unhealthy layer of plaque or tata in the oral cavity. Tongue is the most important organ of the oral cavity and the one which we use constantly for our daily activities. Activities like swallowing are done sometimes unconsciously when we have saliva in our mouth or when we are asleep. Tongue is quite easy to visualize at least the front portion of it. Due to the variation in its topography, many patients get concerned if they see uh, certain structures or they think that it's an abnormality. The undersurface of our tongue, which you see on the left side, should be smooth. There's a prominent fold of mucosa in the midline, which is called as the lingual frenulum, which is indicated by a white arrow over here. On either side of it are small openings that drain saliva from the submandibular gland. This is indicated by the blue arrows. Since our tongue has a very rich blood supply, one can see prominent blood vessels on the undersurface shown by yellow arrows. These vessels can be multiple and can be tortuous, and that is normal anatomy. The top surface of the tongue that you can see on the right-hand side, in contrast, appears velvety. Some people have very prominent groove in the midline, and that's is called as the midline furrow. There may be similar grooves on the side. These become more prominent when you're dehydrated. The edge or the border of the tongue may show some mild scalloping, which corresponds to the implantation of the teeth that the tongue sits against. As I mentioned that the top surface of the tongue is quite rough or velvety, and this is because our tongue is covered with structures called papillae. There are three different types of papillae. The filiform papillae are the most abundant, small hair-like conical projection. They are responsible for the sense of touch and change in pressure or texture. Dispersed throughout the front part of our tongue, the front two-third area, are small mushroom-like papillae, and these are known as the fungiform papillae. These help with the sensation of taste. Some of them can appear prominent, and we have had patients who've presented to us being concerned that there are multiple small lumps all over their tongue. Lastly, the circumvallet papillae, which forms the boundary between the anterior, that is the front two thirds of the tongue, and posterior, which is the back one third of the tongue. These papillae are arranged in a V shape and they're significantly larger than the other papillae. They are about one to two millimeters in size. These normal structures should not be confused with pathology or disease. Sometimes it's hard for untrained eyes to distinguish. Hopefully, our next few slides help to clarify when you should worry about an unusual looking lump in your mouth. So firstly, when we're on the topic of an ulcer, let's describe what an oral ulcer is. An ulcer is any breach in the ext uh, intact external layer of our body. So these external layer, like skin or mucosa, protect our body from environmental factors. 
When there's a break in this layer, pathogens can easily invade our body, and hence, these ulcers can appear inflamed or red. Sometimes, these ulcers develop a slough of dead cells, which appears like whitish layer. If there's a substantial amount of infection, you might sometimes see pus oozing from these ulcers. Generally, ulcers are quite painful. However, early ulcers associated with cancer may be painless and may go unnoticed. It is important to note some features of oral ulcers. Different pathologies or different causes of ulcers have different characteristics. And putting this together help us as clinicians to make proper diagnosis so we can render you appropriate treatment. If you do suffer from ulcers, it will be very beneficial if you record or note all these characteristics as shown on the slide and update your doctor about them. So certain ulcers you may see in only certain locations. For example, aptus or stress ulcers do not appear on top of the tongue, but usually on the lip mucosa or the cheek mucosa. Ulcers from cancer rarely occur in multiple areas of the oral cavity. Ulcers from trauma, like accidentally biting your lip, usually resolve within seven to 10 days. Ulcers that may be associated with autoimmune conditions may be quite painful or might have characteristic features like blistering. Generally, ulcers associated with cancers don't have blisters. If ulcers heal and recur, then they are very unlikely related to malignancy. The commonest causes of oral ulcers are things like trauma. Trauma could be mechanical, like accidentally biting or injuring yourself while eating some hard food. Chemical, sometimes by um, taking some corrosive, uh, corrosive substances or sometimes certain medications when they're improperly taken or left under the tongue or in the oral cavity for too long, or thermal burns by taking very hot food or ingesting hot uh, material. Some ulcers like stress ulcers have no reason or at least at this point, we don't know why they appear. Ulcers due to infection, especially in kids like hand, foot and mouth disease are caused by viral uh, conditions. You can get ulcers because of bacterial infections. Sometimes dental infections can also appear as ulcers. And they are not ulcers per se, but it's from where the dental abscess or pus tries to drain out, and the area in that region gets very inflamed and ulcerated. Some patients develop allergic reactions or hypersensitivity reactions to certain drugs. If you change your toothpaste or rinses, sometimes the new material in this toothpaste or rinses can cause allergic reaction or hypersensitivity reaction and give you inflammation of your oral cavity or ulcers. Some patients are allergic to certain types of food and also get ulcers. There are certain autoimmune conditions and autoimmune conditions are conditions where your own immune system uh, has some uh, defect whereby it starts affecting your own uh, cells, your own body tissues. And these ulcers, uh, these conditions can cause ulcers in the oral cavity and ulcers in other parts of the body, like the skin or in your private area. Nutritional deficiencies like vitamin B12 deficiency or iron deficiency, which is related to anemia, can also present as oral ulcers. The one that we are most worried about is cancer, and cancer could be primary cancer of the oral cavity. Sometimes cancer from other part of the, oral, uh, of the body might metastasize to jaw bones and then appear as ulcers when they progress in the oral cavity. So the most common ulcers that we see in elderly population quite often is due to broken teeth or ill-fitting dentures or inappropriate use of medication. And this picture shows a patient who had a lower denture and it was very loose since he had made it long ago. And this loose denture kept rubbing and causing friction and abrasion against this mucosa. And if you can see in the front of the picture, there's a lump. And this lump is just excess tissue that has caused, that, has, that is a response to friction and abrasion. On the back, on the right-hand side of the jaw, you can also see a small ulcer under the tongue. These kind of ulcers are quite easily treated. You, once you remove the source of irritant and um, you treat the cause of abrasion, these lesions quite heal quite rapidly. Sometimes giving some mild topical analgesia and mild topical steroids help to hasten the process of healing. Recurrent stom aptostomatitis is quite commonly seen in young patients, 
usually uh, young school going or uh, university students come to us, especially during exam periods, uh, reporting that they've developed a lot of ulcers in the mouth. Um, and these are stress-related ulcers. There are three different types, minor ulcers, as you can see in the top picture, which can be about one to two millimeters in size, or major ulcers, which can be up to one centimeter. The herpetiform recurrent aptus ulcers are just multiple ulcers that join together and coalesce and can be quite painful. The unique feature of these ulcers is that they appear and they heal in a few days or up to a week's time, and then they reappear. Usually they don't appear on firm tissues like tongue, uh, the top of the tongue or hard palate. They usually appear on your lip mucosa or inner surface of your cheek. And again, they heal quite easily with topical steroids. Some patients might have them quite often and then might require long-term steroid therapy. The other condition that's autoimmune related is called oral lichen planus. And we do see quite a lot of patients who have this condition. Uh, these patients might also have lesions in their, on their skin or in their private areas in the genital mucosa. They usually appear like you see on the patient uh, on the top, on their tongue, white little fine lines, which we call striae, and they could be multiple and they appear like small little serpentinous or like snake-like white lines that um, coalesce or they join together. Sometimes there might be ulcer. Sometimes these lesions are found incidentally, meaning patients are unaware of them. And when they go for their oral checkups or their annual cleaning, they, the hygienist or the dentist notice this. Some patients might have a bit of soreness or quite often inability to eat spicy food. Very rarely do these uh, ulcers or these uh, lesions bleed, but sometimes they can cover the entire oral cavity and can be quite uncomfortable. The way to Diagnose these ulcers is to do a biopsy because under the microscope, they're very unique features. And uh, once we diagnose a patient with oral lichen planus, they require some sort of topical steroids to help control this condition. Very rarely does this condition over a long period of time may progress to cancer. And these patients require monitoring six months or every at least once a year to ensure that these lesions are not changing in size. Some immune-related conditions, usually they appear, as I mentioned, like blisters. Patients come to us saying that, oh, we noticed that there was a bubble of water and it burst and there's now a white layer on the top of this ulcer. And these are usually classical signs of autoimmune-related uh, blisters or conditions like pemphigus or pemphigoid. These ulcers can appear quite remarkable and sometimes can be quite scary. However, they rarely ever progress to cancer. The way to diagnose them, again, it requires a biopsy. These ulcers can sometimes persist for a few weeks before they heal because they're quite large in size, and they sometimes require steroids in a very heavy dose, sometimes to be taken in form of tablets um, to help control this condition. The way to help manage this condition, other than steroids, is also to ensure that you keep well hydrated, you control the pain, and take measures to maintain your oral hygiene so these ulcers don't get infection. Next are uh, conditions called as precancerous or dysplastic lesions. These are lesions or these are ulcers in the oral cavity that are not yet cancer, uh, but can change into cancer, especially in patients who have high risk, like patients who are smokers or who drink quite heavily. Um, these lesions could transform, for example, say if a patient had oral lichen planus, it can transform into a precancerous lesion, or other lesions in the oral cavity can change into precancerous lesions. These lesions can be quite difficult uh, from a diagnostic point of view because they can appear quite heterogeneous. Certain areas might be very superficial, certain areas might have thick lump underneath, um, and patients might require biopsies from multiple sites or at multiple points in time to ensure that none of these areas have changed into cancer. Sometimes we can use AIDS, like if you see on the right-hand side, um, the ulcer is painted blue. There are certain dyes that we can use to help us with diagnosis which areas are more dysplastic or more uh, abnormal. Sometimes certain lights, like uh, special kinds of UV lights, are used to diagnose areas that are 
are heavily damaged or might be changing into cancer. But the gold standard still is biopsy. So we might require biopsy to confirm whether there's any cancer or not. Apart from being painful, these uh, ulcers can also bleed or have patients can have difficulty speaking or moving their tongue. So we provide them symptomatic relief and they may sometimes require topical steroids as well to control these uh, lesions. They of course require very close monitoring because there's a very high chance that these precancerous lesion can eventually change into cancer. Sometimes patients don't get relief with simple treatment like steroids or analgesia. And then if a condition is recurrent or it's not improving or patient has a lot of discomfort, we can opt to ablate or burn away in loose term the top layer where this dysplastic lesions are using lasers. And quite often, once we have ablated um, these lesions with laser, the new mucosa or the new skin that comes underneath usually can appear quite healthy. However, this can only um, be helpful if patients help to control risk factors like reducing their smoking and uh, drinking habits. Sometimes you can get ulcers that look like this. These are called viral warts, and classically they are described as cauliflower-like looking lesions. And these ulcers also, again, it could be on the lips or in your oral cavity and can be quite uncomfortable to the patient and pose difficulties in speaking or eating. These ulcers can break sometimes or bleed quite easily. And again, um, we can use lasers or we can use surgery to excise these lesions and they're taken out completely so that we can ensure that there's no cancer lying underneath. So if you see this picture, this lady had a um, lesion on her lower lip. And this, the other picture shows you two weeks after laser therapy, where the ulcer was, the lesion was completely taken out and new mucosa or the new skin is forming over there and doesn't have similar features. So coming to the one that we all are here to raise awareness about is oral cancers. Um, oral cancers, um, as I mentioned, uh, can be quite debilitating and Classically, it was thought that cancers happen only in elderly population or patients who have very high risk factors. However, there are studies now that show that more and more young patients are getting cancers. We see patients in their 30s and 40s presenting with cancers. And what is worrying is these patients are patients who have no previous risk factors, who are non-smokers, non-drinkers, who don't have family history of cancer. So it's very important that uh, even younger generation or younger population uh, does a proper checkup and keep an eye so that they don't get cancers or if they do, it is detected quite early. The ulcers that are associated with cancer usually present with few classical uh, signs. Some of them are easy contact bleeding, like you can see in the bottom picture. When we touch the ulcer with a small wooden spatula, it just bleeds quite uh, remarkably and quite profusely sometimes. Um, these ulcers are not uniform ulcers like you see in other uh, previous described ulcers. They can be quite irregular. They can be quite firm or hard to touch, which in our medical terminology is termed as indurated. The central area can appear quite necrotic and dirty and sluffy because the tissue in that area might be dead. And sometimes these ulcers can get infected and can be quite painful. The most important thing about these ulcers to note is that they don't disappear or they don't uh, recover. They persist for more than one to two weeks. And as time progresses, they can get bigger in size. So if you ever notice an ulcer that's more than, that's been present for more than one to two weeks, uh, you should report to your doctors early. And I say this so, if you have a look at this uh, picture, uh, as a classic example, the gentleman in this picture had some white areas on his uh, left cheek. And these areas look like this classic lesion or precancerous lesion. And the patient was advised for biopsy. The patient, however, had some family commitments and went overseas for a month. And within one month, when he came back, he had frank ulcers um, that were very suspicious of cancer. And you can see in the bottom picture how these ulcers have prog progressed. The central area looks white and necrotic. There are hard lumps around it. And then once the patient has cancers, the treatment is, has to be a bit more aggressive. Um, 
and patient requires more close monitoring and rehabilitation, which my colleagues will, um, will elaborate in the next uh, talks. So take home message, advanced oral cancers can have very poor outcome. There are certain modifiable risk factors, things like spirits, which is alcohol, spices, and we are talking about spices like betel nut and uh, betel leaves, et cetera, not your usual spices that we use in cooking. Smoking, um, chronic infection in the oral cavity from poor oral hygiene, sharp teeth that causes trauma and ulcers, and classically uh, sexually transmitted disease like syphilis, which can cause or increase your risk of getting oral cancers. Um, Self-examination of oral cavity and good oral hygiene maintenance um, helps to detect these lesions early. If you have ulcers that last for more than one to two weeks, if they bleed quite easily, or there's a hard lump in your oral cavity, or you notice that there's a lesion that is increasing in size as time progresses, or there's worsening pain, please report to your doctor immediately, and we can assess and take necessary steps to help us diagnose whether there's cancer. And if it's diagnosed early, uh, we can help treat and cure it uh, quite quickly as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rahul, for your uh, talk. We've received a few questions, uh, some of it which we are trying to answer as we go. Many others will be answered uh, during the Q&A session as well. So continue to post your questions for Dr. Rahul as well as our uh, subsequent specialists. For the next uh, segment, we will have a talk by Dr. Liang Weihao, who's a consultant at the Department of Plastic and Reconstructive as well as Aesthetic Surgery at the Singapore General Hospital, and he will be talking about what follows the uh, treatment of uh, oral cancer, which is the reconstruction after oral cancer surgery. Um, Dr. Liang, whenever you're ready, uh, go ahead. Okay, um, hi, uh, good morning everyone. I hope everybody can see my slides as well as hear yes. me clearly. Yeah, um, thank you so much for taking the time off on a very precious uh, Saturday morning to attend this webinar and to hear us uh, talk a little bit about uh, oral cancer surgery. So uh, I'm Wei Hao, okay? uh, I'm a plastic surgery consultant uh, in SGH and I work very closely with several of the and neck surgeons uh, in NCC like uh, Dr. Rahu. So today uh, I'll be talking, uh, giving a short talk about reconstruction after oral cancer surgery. Okay. Hold on. Uh, IT issues as usual. Okay, can. Yeah. Okay, so uh, before I start, I'd like to warn <laughs> that there are clinical photos in this presentation uh, that some viewers may find uh, disturbing. Uh, they're quite gory, they're quite gross, okay. Uh, unfortunately, this is the nature of my job, uh, and I can't really talk about uh, reconstructing oral cancer surgery wounds if I don't even show photos of oral cancer surgery wounds. Then the talk will be quite meaningless. Uh. Uh, so please be warned, okay. Uh, look away from the screen if the pictures are too much for you. <laughs> Then I also like to say that while my patients have given permission for their photos to be used, uh, please respect their privacy and uh, do not take photographs or screenshots, okay? So uh, with that out of the way, okay, you know those very gross, disgusting photos of tumors that you see on your secret packets, right? And I'm sure many of you uh, look at it and say, ah, yeah, fake one, lah. it's drawn using computer imaging and whatnot, okay? Uh, actually, I, uh, such tumors are real, okay? These are just some examples of the kind of tumors and cancers that we see, okay? Uh, of course, these photographs show uh, pretty advanced cancers, cancers that have been growing for quite a long time. So if you've been paying attention to Dr. Rahul's talk and knowing what to watch out for and get the cancers detected, diagnosed and treated early, this would not, never happen to you or anybody you know, and then you wouldn't have to pay attention for the rest of my talk. <laughs> But unfortunately, um, we still do see quite a lot of patients whose cancers are quite advanced by the time they come and see us. So this obviously needs to uh, be removed uh, through cancer surgery. 
And after cancer surgery, these are the kind of wounds and defects that are left, okay? Big holes and wounds in the face that we as plastic and reconstructive surgeons uh, need to deal with and reconstruct, okay? Yeah, but first you may be wondering, what has a plastic surgeon got to do with this? I mean, don't they only do all the aesthetic surgery, lasers, Botox, fillers, and things like that? Okay, so, well, contrary to popular belief and what you see in the media, yes, uh, plastic surgeons do aesthetic surgeries and procedures, and we also provide such aesthetic services even in a government hospital. But we do a lot more than just aesthetic surgery. Okay, we also do a lot of reconstructive surgery to replace and patch up big wounds and defects like what you saw earlier, not just for uh, cancers and oral cavity or the head and neck cancers, but for other cancers like breast cancer, colon cancer, for wounds from trauma, road traffic accidents, things like that. We do all the reconstructive surgery for all these patients. So back to reconstructive surgery. Right? Okay, first of all, I would like to share a little bit like, you must be wondering how, how do, do we do it? Like for example, after oral cancer surgery, when you have a huge wound like this, how do you even patch up this wound? How do you even close it? Okay, so that we can actually end up with something like this, okay? So what we need to do is we need to borrow tissue or flesh from other parts of the body, bring it to the wound, and then stitch everything up to close the wound so, we end, so that we end up something like this, okay? And these tissues are called flaps, and I'll be referring to this term flaps for the rest of the talk, okay? It just means tissues from the body. Okay, but it's uh, not just such a simple matter. Oh, well, I just cut out a piece of tissue out. Uh, for example, from a thigh like this, I cut out a piece of tissue and I will just use it like that. Uh, it won't work, okay? And the tissue will turn black and die, like in this photo on the right, because it won't have any blood supply. It doesn't have a blood circulation to give the flap oxygen and nutrients so that it can continue to survive and to live, okay? So what we need to do is that we need to not just cut out a piece of flesh, but we need to look for the blood vessels. And these very, very tiny blood vessels that supply blood to the flap, they're very, very tiny, two to three millimeters in size in the, at the largest portion. Okay? And very often, they're less than one millimeter in size. So you can see this magnified view. You can see these tiny reddish streaks. I hope you can see my mouse pointer. These tiny reddish streaks, right? Yeah. These are the tiny, less than one millimeter in size arteries and veins, right? The supply blood to the flap, okay? So you can see that they're really small. So we look for these very tiny blood vessels, okay? And then we very carefully free them, follow them, and preserve them all the way along, okay? Together with the tissue, with flap, so that the flap will continue the blood circulation and thus it can continue to survive. And then, for example, okay, this again, a uh, flap that we took from the thigh. And then when we flip it over, you can see from the other side of the flap, you can see all these blood vessels that are still connected to the flap and supplying the flap with blood. That's how this flap can continue to survive. Okay, And this is partly what makes the surgery uh, difficult and very long because these vessels are so tiny, so small, and so delicate and very fragile. And if we accidentally damage them during surgery, then the flap will not survive. And then after that, after we've prepared the flap, we'll cut the blood vessels so that here you can see that we have disconnected and detached the flap completely free from the body. Okay, like you can see here with the blood vessel dangling down here. Okay, so this flap is now ready for use for reconstruction. Okay, and it can be moved freely to any part of the body where it's needed. In this case, we are talking about oral cancer surgery, right? So we'll be moving this flap to the head and the neck region because that's where the wound is. Okay. So then what we do is that we, after bringing the flap up to the neck, right, we still need to restore blood circulation to this flap because we have cut the blood vessels already, right? So otherwise, this very nice piece of flap with all the carefully preserved and attached blood vessels, it will still die and it still won't accomplish anything. So what we then need to do is to take these tiny blood vessels of the flap and join them to equally tiny blood vessels in the neck. Okay, it's almost like joining tiny pipes together so that the blood can flow from the neck vessels to the flap vessels and then circulate in the flap to keep the flap alive, okay? So to stitch these uh, very tiny vessels together, we use uh, sutures that are very fine, way finer than the finest hair you can find on your body, okay? They're so fine, we can barely see them with our naked eyes. So we need to use a microscope to do this part of the surgery, 
Okay, so this kind of surgery is called microsurgery. Yeah, we surgeons are not very creative with our nomenclature, lah, but that's what we call it, microsurgery. Okay, and here I hope the video works, but this is a short video of like to show that after joining up the blood vessels, the blood flow will be restored to the flap, and you can see here the tiny artery is happily jumping because blood is flowing through uh, to the flap. Uh, with each heartbeat, the blood vessel jumps. Okay, that's what it looks like. Okay. Okay, so now with this, you guys know how we do this surgery. So with this ability to locate, preserve, and then restore the blood supply or flaps, right? we can harvest all sorts of different flaps from any part of the body. And we can take different kinds of tissues that we need. We can take skin if we need skin. We can take muscle if we need muscle. Or we can take bone if we need bone. Or we can take any combination of tissues. Like for example, in the photo on the right, you can see the skin and bone. Okay, so we can take combination of tissues uh, to use in reconstruction depending on what exactly is it that we need. And we can take flaps from any part of the body also. But uh, the more common locations that we take flaps from would be, for example, the chest you can see here. Okay, the thighs, as you've seen in my previous example. Sometimes we take flaps from the wrist. Here you can see the flap here lifting. We lifted the flap off. You can see the blood vessels still dangling and still attached underneath it. And lastly, the calf. Okay, this is a place that we always go to if we want to harvest a flap of bone. Okay, so we always go to the leg. Okay. Now, after seeing all these things, all these kind of flap surgeries that we take flaps from other parts of the body, I'm sure a question that a lot of you may have for your minds is. Is it safe or not? Is it safe to just anyhow cut and take flaps from parts of the body like this? Would those areas be okay after the surgery? Okay, so everybody may have heard of this saying, uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Okay, so this is essentially what we are doing as reconstructive surgeons. We take flaps from one part of the body, Peter, to use in another part of the body, Paul, who happens to need it more. Okay, but in reconstructive surgery, we also have a second line to this saying that we rock Peter to pay Paul, but only if Peter can afford it. We will only take flaps from a location that can afford to lose this flesh and has minimal risks of complications so that we don't cause additional problems for our patients by taking the flap from part of their body. Okay, so for example, let's say uh, we want to take skin, right? Okay, we will choose areas that have extra excess skin so that we can close the wound easily after harvesting the flap, okay? But of course, there will be scars, but unfortunately, there's no way to perform surgery without scars. There's no such thing as scarless surgeries. So, but we as plastic surgeons will always try to stitch and close the wound up nicely so that hopefully the scar appearance will not, too, will not be too bad, okay? Okay, that's for skin. Let's say we want to take muscle. Then we will choose muscles that are less important and make sure that there are other muscles left behind because we have many muscles in our body, right? We want to make sure that there are other muscles left behind that has a similar function so that patients do not get weakness after the surgery, okay? Let's say we want to take bone then, okay? As I mentioned, we usually take a bone from the leg, right? And then the number one question that all my patients will ask me, doctor, if you take the bone from my leg, can I still walk after that? So obviously the answer is yes, otherwise we won't take that bone, okay? Yes, you will still be able to walk because everybody has two bones in the leg. Okay, the large bone contributes 90% of the function of the leg or the smaller bone only contributes 10%. So we take this smaller bone for flap surgery which at least more than enough bone left for the patient to walk or even run after they recover from surgery, okay? Now, let's go back to talking about reconstruction of the oral cancer surgery. So what exactly are we trying to achieve? Are we just talking about covering up that big hole with a flap and then that's it, we're done? Um, not really, there's a lot more to it, okay? Uh, first of all, cancer by now is life-saving, okay? Uh, but cancer surgery can also be very deforming. Uh, as you can see, uh, can you imagine just looking at the photos of the wounds that I've shown you, right? And cancer surgery can also Im affect important functions like your eating, your drinking, your swallowing, your speaking, all can be affected after oral cancer surgery. So what we do as uh, reconstructive surgeons is we try to restore firstly the form uh, and function and aesthetics of the patient. So what does it mean? Form is basically we store the structure or the anatomy of the patient's face or the mouth, okay? We also try to return the function so that they are able to eat, to chew, to speak as much as possible. 
And then lastly, we also try to give them as much as possible uh, an acceptable aesthetic uh, cosmetic result. Okay, these are the main guiding principles for all reconstructive surgery, not just oral cancer surgery, actually. Okay, so back to oral cancer surgery uh, reconstruction for that. Um, if you view the oral cavity as almost like a box, right, you can see that uh, different structures of the mouth uh, forms the different walls of this box. So for example, the front of the box is formed by the lips, okay? The bottom of the box is formed by your tongue and your jawbone, for example. The sides of the box is formed by the insides of our cheeks, okay? Over here, the insides of the cheek, right? Okay, and then the top of the bone, or the box, sorry, is formed by the palate, which is actually part of our cheekbone. It forms the palate here. So any wall of this box can have cancer and may need surgery. And if they do have surgery, then we will need to reconstruct the wound after that, okay? So let's talk about the different regions. Lah, huh? Okay, so for example, let's talk about lips, okay? The front of the box is formed by this, uh, our lips. And our lips have very important functions, okay? They allow us to obviously close our mouth very tightly, okay? This allow us to uh, help to prevent the uh, drooling of saliva. Also helps to keep uh, food and drinks within our mouths during eating so that it doesn't fall out over the place. And of course, lastly, the lips also help us to speak and pronounce words properly too. Okay, so it's very important to reconstruct the lips. Okay, so for example, in this case of a lip cancer, we have reconstructed the lip as you can see here, uh, so as to allow him to retain the functions of his lips. Okay, what about the tongue? The bottom of the box is formed by the tongue, okay? and the tongue is also very important. It's obviously very important in allowing us to speak, to pronounce words properly. Also very important for chewing and swallowing, okay? because when uh, we chew, it's our tongue that moves the food around the mouth so that the food is broken down evenly by our teeth. And then as we swallow, it's the tongue that pushes the food backwards to the throat so that the food can be swallowed down to our gullet and then down to our stomach. Okay? So tongue is very important. So here you can see in this patient, we have actually uh, had to remove part of the tongue because of uh, cancer. And then we have reconstructed the missing portion with a flap. So unfortunately, you can see that the flap is uh, a bit darker in color because uh, we had to take it from uh, other parts of the body, which is a bit uh, dark skin. So that's why you can see the difference in color, but the function remains quite good after this surgery. Uh, in this other patient, okay, not just part of the tongue is removed, the entire tongue has been removed, okay? So the main problem in such a case is that it's not just you lose the function of the tongue, but that this big wound at the bottom of the mouth, at the bottom of the box, okay, is actually goes down all the way down to the neck, okay? So this is a big problem is because our mouths are very dirty, it's full of saliva and full of bacteria, right? So you can imagine if this saliva and bacteria flow from the mouth and down into the neck, it can cause very bad infection in the neck. And you can imagine that the neck has many of the big blood vessels, many big veins, many big arteries. If these blood vessels get infected, they can burst. Okay, you can imagine how life-threatening such a this kind of bleeding can be. So we need to seal off the bottom of this box, seal it off so that we can prevent the saliva from flowing down to the neck and hopefully save the patient's life. Okay. Okay, next, the cheeks, okay? The sides of the box are from the inner lining of our cheeks, okay? So you can see the wound over here. After cancer surgery, you have a big wound on the sides of the cheek, okay? If we do not reconstruct this wound properly, there'll be very severe scarring because all wounds heal by scarring, right? So there'll be very severe scarring and this scar can be very tight. It can even prevent the patient from even opening the mouth to even speak or eat or, 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 or drink. Okay, so what we do is we put a flap there, okay, to help prevent this problem. And you can see this patient can open his mouth very well on the photo on the right, okay. And then uh, we want to talk about the palate, okay, which forms the top of the box, okay. So this is our palate, okay. And you can see this patient with a big cancer over there, okay. And this palate is also part of a form by our cheekbone. So um, very often when you have a cancer in the palate, it means the cheekbone also has to be removed. So you can see in this wound, the cheek, okay, plus the palate has been removed together, okay. Obviously, such a wound has to be reconstructed because we need to keep the oral cavity and the nasal, the nose cavity, we need to keep them separate, okay. Why is this important? It's because if we do not keep the oral and the nasal cavity separate, uh, so the, first of all, the patient's speech will be very nasal sounding, okay? okay? And sometimes in the nasal speech can be so bad, right, that you, you can't understand what they're saying. So it's quite, 
quite bad for the patient. Okay? Not only that, every time they eat or drink, the food and the fluids in the mouth will actually go up into the nose. And this, nose this is a, called nasal regurgitation, so it's quite uncomfortable for the patient as well. And then lastly, you can imagine that we've removed such a huge chunk of cheekbone. This will cause this area to sink down and then result in quite bad facial deformity. Okay, So using a flap to reconstruct the palate and the cheekbone at the same time, okay, like you can see in this example, helps us to prevent all these problems that we just mentioned. Okay, And then lastly, the, I want to talk a little bit about the jawbone or what we call the mandible. It's also part of the oral cavity. Okay, The jawbone is obviously important in allowing us to open our mouths right? so that we can speak, we can, we can eat, we can drink. right? And we also need our teeth to be able to chew food properly. Okay, So when cancer occurs at the jawbone, the jawbone will have to be removed like you can see in this picture here. Okay. We can reconstruct the jawbone. Obviously, because we removed the bone, we want to replace it with bone. right? Okay, and where do we take the bone? Remember, I say we take the bone from the leg. Okay, but the problem with the leg bone is that the leg bone is very straight. Okay, whereas our jaw bone is very curved and very three dimensional in shape. Right, so what we need to do is we need to then saw this straight bone that we take from the leg. We need to saw it into smaller pieces, shorter pieces, like you can see in this photo here. Okay, so this allows us to place the pieces, these shorter pieces in a more curved fashion to better resemble the original contour of the jawbone. Okay, and then we can hold these pieces in place with our special titanium plates and screws uh, that you can see in this picture here. Okay, now you can imagine that for a bone flap like this, okay, when we, where we saw the bone to, to reconstruct the three-dimensional shape of the jawbone, right? So where we saw the bone, the angle at which we saw the bone, how long each individual segment uh, have to be. All these have to be done in a very precise manner. Otherwise, the reconstructed jawbone may be very different from the original jawbone. The patient may end up uh, having a crooked jaw, which not only doesn't look nice, but because the jaw is crooked, the teeth are also in the wrong position now. So they may have difficulty to even chew food properly. Okay, So it's a very precise thing that we're doing here. But in the old days, uh, we used to do this by very carefully measuring with a ruler, making templates, cutting the paper ruler into small little templates, and then very slowly sawing and then chipping off the bone bit by bit, trying to get a shape right. But you can imagine that sometimes uh, this process, uh, a bit trial and error, right, may not be very, very accurate. Right? Okay, so what we do nowadays is that we do this thing called virtual surgical planning or VSP for short. Okay, we use a computer software to plan how we do the reconstruction, how we plan to, to remove to, to, to remove the cancer as well and the reconstruction. So we plan everything using uh, this computer software and we plan this before the surgery. Okay, this was to give us the most accurate and the best match possible. Uh, and this um, VSP has allowed us to achieve accuracy that was impossible to achieve in the past. There are commercial companies that offer these kind of services internationally, but they're very expensive. The whole process takes very long over the month, which is not good because we don't want our cancer patients to wait so long before they go for their cancer surgery. Right? So which is why here in the SGH campus, uh, the few of us, we have collaborated uh, amongst ourselves and also uh, worked together with National Dental Center to develop our own capability in virtual surgical planning and 3D printing for jawbone reconstruction so that we can do it cheaper and faster than the commercial companies, okay? So we are the first to utilize this new technology in Singapore, and we do this for all our jawbone reconstructing, uh, reconstructing uh, surgeries, okay? So uh, we use VSP to plan the surgery, but also on top of that, we do 3D printing, because 3D printing is very popular now. It's all the rage, right? Everybody is doing it. We are also doing it, okay? Uh, we use 3D printing to help with our surgery. So we print things like the models of the skull and the jaw, okay, to help us plan our surgeries. We also print a very specifically designed, specially designed guides that you can see here that we can use during the surgery itself to help us with the sawing and the plating of the bone during the surgery. Okay, so I also want to mention a little bit about when we have to remove the jawbone uh, because of cancer surgery, you can see all the teeth on the jawbone, right? Yeah, the teeth are obviously removed at the same time. Okay, so as part of a jawbone reconstruction, we also work with the dental surgeons to insert very specialized dental implants into our bone flap, okay? So that later on, we can use these implants to anchor dentures directly to, to the bone so that it's very secure, okay? I'll show you pictures of what we mean, okay, in a while, okay? 
because uh, traditionally these kind of dental implants have to be replaced in a separate surgery many many months later okay but with vsp and with 3d printing we can now design guides and plan properly that allows to very accurately put these kind of dental implants immediately during the very first reconstructive surgery okay and again we are the first in singapore to do this so we actually managed to save the patient from having to go for an additional surgery Okay, and this is what I mean by dental implants. You can see the dental implants in the bone flap. This is after the patient has fully recovered. This is what the implants look like. Okay, and here, this is what she looks like with the full set of teeth restored. Okay, because these dentures are anchored to the bone, they are a lot more secure than our normal dentures. Okay, the normal dentures can be very loose, they can dislodge, you can have food stuck very easily underneath the dentures, very uncomfortable, inconvenient to use. These kind of dentures are much better. Okay. So because we developed this new service, this new technology, we also want to make sure that we're doing it right. Lah. So we took all the cases that we have done uh, using VSP and 3D printing, and then we analyzed the results using special software. Uh, uh, and then we check like, you know, after surgery, whether the results that we got, is it what we planned for initially? And we found that our results are quite good. Okay, The differences between before and after surgery right, is only about two to three millimeters on average, which is pretty decent and comparable with... Uh, the results uh, around the world. So we are doing a decent job at it. Okay, so with this uh, new technology, we are able to restore their jaw contour to how it was like before, so that it almost seems like these patients never went for any surgery at all. And that's what we hope to achieve. Lah. Okay, so I've talked a lot about flaps, the flap surgery, doing reconstruction for different parts of the oral cavity. Okay, so after all this kind of very long and complicated surgery, right, and uh, patients have all recovered and gone home, they, you know, can we now breathe a sigh of relief and say, okay, job done, that's it. Uh, no need to do anything else for the patient. Unfortunately, no. Our job as a reconstructive uh, um, plastic surgeon is still not done because there are still things that we can do for them, even after they have recovered and discharged home already, okay? We can use the skills and tools that we have that we use for aesthetic surgery, you know, things like your lasers and fillers and Botox, okay? We can use these skills and tools to also help to improve the appearance and quality of life of our patients after their cancer treatment, okay? Surviving the cancer and surviving the cancer treatment is really hard enough, okay? They also have to deal with the scars and the deformities from cancer surgery because these things may happen despite uh, all our efforts in reconstructive surgery, they still get scars and some form of deformities, okay? The thing is for cancers in other parts of our body, like internal organs or whatnot, okay, we can hide the scars and deformities under our clothes. For our face and oral cancer surgery, we can't hide the face. I mean, nowadays we wear masks, but even that we have to take off the mask at some point of time. So we can't hide the face so easily. Okay, So any scars and deformities will be highly visible to everyone. Uh, and we do not want our patients to get insensitive comments or insensitive looks and stares by public, for example. We don't want them to avoid going out of their house because of this. We want them to have good quality of life and continue to do what they were doing before the cancer happened. Okay. So to do this, what is it that we can do for them to help improve their outcomes even after the surgery? Okay, so we can let's say for let's say let's start talking about lasers. Okay, first we can use lasers, right, to treat scars. Okay, lasers are commonly used in cosmetic surgery and plastic surgery, right, to improve things like skin complexion, improve pigmentation. But we can use them to treat scars, uh, not just acne scars that you see on the face, but also surgical scars. Okay, so patients, as I mentioned, will have scars after the surgery. Okay, there's no such thing as scarlet surgery, and sometimes the scars can be a bit thick, a bit ugly, like in this top picture, okay? So we can actually do laser scar treatment, okay, to hopefully improve the scar appearance, okay? There's no way we can make scars disappear, but we can improve the way they look, we can make the scars softer, and we can try to make them as unobvious as possible, okay? Like for example, this patient has a scar on the neck from a surgery, but I can see, I mean, it's a little bit dark over here, but otherwise you can't really see very well that there's a big scar on the neck, okay? Besides scar therapy, we can also use lasers to help remove things like pigmentations and tattoos. So in this specific patient, uh, he unfortunately, because of the nature of his uh, defect in the oral cavity, he needed a very specific flap to reconstruct the wound. So we had to use that flap. But unfortunately, there was already a tattoo on that flap. So after he's recovered, I started doing laser treatment to remove the tattoos. And this is here, you can see some improvements after just, just one session of the lasers. Okay, with more sessions, we can probably remove almost all the pigment on the flap. Okay. 
Besides lasers, we also do fillers. Okay, for those of you who do not know what are fillers, fillers are all these synthetic man-made substances that we inject into a certain area to give it a bit more volume. Okay, this is very commonly used on the face in plastic surgery. Okay, but we can also use it in our cancer patients. Okay, so for example, sometimes, <coughs> excuse me, the contour of the patient's face may not be perfectly symmetrical after surgery and especially after radiotherapy, okay, despite our best efforts in uh, reconstructive surgery. So what can we do? We can then inject fillers into these areas okay, to sculpt the facial contour and improve their appearance. But fillers are very expensive and they don't last forever. So sometimes instead of using fillers, we sometimes use the patient's own fat. So we take the fat from areas like the tummy or the thighs, and then we inject the fat into the areas that we need, and this is called fat grafting. Okay, so you can see in this picture the pre and post fat grafting. We have improved its contour of the jaw much uh, to, to much better. Okay, than before. Okay, and then another big category of uh, cosmetic procedures that we do is a uh, Botox or botulinum toxin. Okay, Botox is actually a neurotoxin, so it's a substance that temporarily paralyzes muscles after injection. So in cosmetic surgery, you use them to weaken very specific muscles on the face to reduce wrinkles. Okay. Again, we can use it for our cancer patients. Okay, because sometimes such patients, after surgery and radiotherapy, they have a very hard, very stiff neck. They can barely turn the neck. Okay. So what we can do is we can do Botox injections to help to release some of this stiffness and discomfort in the neck. Okay. So you can see our responsibilities towards our patients remain long after they're fully recovered from the cancer treatment. Okay, okay. time is running out and I'm also coming to the end of my talk. Okay, so ultimately, right, as was mentioned earlier, right, the face and neck is very highly visible location. Cancer surgery in an area like this can be very deforming. Okay, surgery can also affect critical functions like eating, drinking, swallowing and speaking, things that we all take for granted, right? but are also important in our everyday life, okay? So as plastics and reconstructive surgeons, okay, we hope to, we hope that everybody, if they ever develop cancer, gets the cancer picked up and detected early so that you never have to go for extensive surgery like this. But in the event that any patient needs such surgeries, we hope to be able to restore some semblance of a normal appearance as much as possible, okay, so that we also want to ensure that our patients have good function and also to restore and maintain their confidence and their self-esteem and uh, allow them to continue to live uh, lives of uh, good quality, okay? So, um, because, uh, yeah, because no matter how hard the work is, right, how difficult and how challenging the surgery is, right, nothing gives us, uh, myself and my cancer, uh, hair and neck cancer uh, colleagues, and nothing gives us better satisfaction than seeing the happy smiles of our patients and their families, lah. okay? And with that, I end my talk and I thank you for your kind attention. Okay, I'll stop sharing now. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Weihao. This is very interesting. And uh, your pictures especially are super uh, interesting for everybody to see, although it's not something that uh, most people, especially because it's not something people outside would see every day, unlike us. Um, so there are a lot of questions that are coming in. You can take a look at the Q&A panel to choose some for answering later. Meantime, we will uh, proceed to the third segment of our uh, program for today, which will be uh, delivered to us by Ms. Alberta Lowe, who's the speech therapist at the Department of Speech Therapy at the Singapore General Hospital. She'll be talking about what follows now the reconstructive part of the journey of a cancer patient, which is the speech and swallowing rehabilitation. All right, so I hope you uh, enjoy and Alberta, go ahead. Hey, thank you so much. Um, yes, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Alberta and I'm a speech therapist here at Singapore General Hospital and I've been working here for just over five years. And a large part of my work involves uh, working with individuals with cancer, specifically in the head and neck region. So it's a great privilege to be able to share with you today more about speech therapy and our role in the speech and swallowing rehabilitation for individuals undergoing head and neck cancer treatment. So speech therapy is a pretty broad discipline with many areas, but the main ones we are concerned with um, in head and neck cancer treatment are swallowing and also communication, uh, namely speech and voice. So uh, normal swallowing involves the ability to transport food and drink from the mouth through the throat and into the stomach in a safe and efficient manner. 
Speech is the ability to articulate or pronounce uh, words, sounds, phrases clearly, and to be understood by others. Voice is the ability of the vocal folds to produce sound, and that is the function of our voice box. And as mentioned before, although we rely heavily on these basic abilities to function well on a day-to-day -day basis, we often don't think very much about it. We may even take some of these abilities for granted. However, an individual who has oral cancer may struggle very much in these areas. So this is a head and neck diagram with some key areas highlighted. So cancer in any of the regions um, of the nose, the mouth and the throat uh, can affect a person's swallowing and communication abilities. Factors like the size of the cancer and extent of its spread can affect the individual's level of function. As today's talk of uh, mainly focuses on cancers of the oral cavity, we will focus on the areas listed here. Okay, so the lips, and this includes the upper and lower lip, the tongue, which is a very part, a very large part of the mouth. Uh, so the tongue, um, you know, starts from the tip and extends all the way to the back of the throat to an area that we call the base of tongue. And the tongue is rooted to the floor of the mouth, which is the area below your tongue. The upper jaw uh, is the roof of your mouth. It's called the maxilla, or we also call it the heart palate. So this is the bone that holds all your upper teeth and separates the nasal and oral cavity. And towards the back of the heart palate is the soft palate, where your uvula is. The lower jaw, or the mandible, holds your lower teeth, and is the part that moves a lot when you are chewing or talking. The cheek area is also called the buccal cavity, so the cheek muscles help to push food uh, from the sides of the mouth into the middle. And finally, there's this little area called the retromolar trigone area, uh, behind where your wisdom teeth would be. So cancer can actually arise from any of these areas. As mentioned by our previous speakers, uh, treatment options for head and neck cancer can include surgery, where the tumor is resected and uh, reconstruction is performed. Um, there are also uh, other uh, forms of treatment, uh, including radiotherapy and chemotherapy. So an individual may be recommended a one or a combination of these treatments. So for example, uh, a tongue cancer, um, the recommended treatment might be surgery first, followed by uh, radiotherapy after. In any case, the course of treatment for the cancer can lead to implications on the speech, voice, and swallowing abilities of the individual. So we'll start first um, by discussing the function of swallowing um, and explore how cancer and its treatment may affect it. So we view swallowing in two phases. I'll be using the word bolus, uh, which refers to anything that you swallow. Okay, so it could be a bite of a biscuit, it could be a sip of water, uh, a pill, or even your own saliva. So the first phase of swallowing is the oral phase, and this um, includes putting the bolus into your mouth moving it around the mouth, chewing it, controlling it with your tongue, and finally pushing it back to the throat um, when you are ready to swallow. And this phase uh, can generally be controlled by the individual. So for example, right, you can chew a biscuit for just 10 seconds, or you can chew it for 60 seconds, depending on what you prefer. You can also drink quickly from a cup, or you can take uh, small sips one at a time. The second phase, however, is more automatic, and this is the pharyngeal phase, or the actual swallow. So if you take a look at the video here, you can see that the bolus is being pushed back or squeezed uh, down the throat and into the esophagus. Okay? When this happens, um, the larynx, or the area where your Adam's apple is, actually rises, and a little muscle called epiglottis flaps down and closes the airway. So this prevents you from choking on the food or drink that you have just swallowed. So if you happen to have a glass of water with you, you can try taking a sip of water and just think about what your lips, your tongue, and your throat are doing. You'll realize that it happens really quickly. Yeah, swallowing happens so fast, um, but it is successful only when all these muscles work well together and with perfect timing. So now imagine, what are some of the possible problems we might face with a tumor on any of these areas? Or what difficulties might a person have after a surgery uh, in which some of these tissues might be resected? Okay. So any difficulty with swallowing uh, is called dysphagia. Okay. And the word is on the top right-hand corner of the slide, so dysphagia. For a cancer on the lips, an individual may not be able to hold food and water well in the mouth, resulting in spillage. 
So the picture here shows a patient who had a resection of a tumor on the upper lip. So she might then have some trouble with lip closure and experience some water spilling when she's drinking. For the tongue, the individual may have difficulty moving food around the mouth. So when we want to chew something, our tongue actually brings the food to the sides for chewing. And when we are ready to swallow, uh, the tongue gathers the food back to the center for swallowing. So this uh, individual might have then problems controlling or manipulating the bolus in the mouth, uh, resulting in accidental spillage of the bolus back to the throat, or maybe the person might have a lot of food or water left in the mouth even after swallowing. So the picture here shows somebody who had about half the tongue resected. Imagine that it's going to be quite difficult for him to move food around the mouth or to control water. Uh, the water may just very easily flow back um, and cause the person to choke. Surgeries in the upper and lower jaw can result in difficulty chewing, and it can also lead to a jaw opening difficulty, which is what we call trismus. Okay? Surgeries to the upper jaw or maxilla may also result in nasal regurgitation, which was mentioned before. So this is when food or water is being squeezed upwards into the nasal cavity um, during the swallow. And so some of these individuals, they may actually have food or water um, coming out from their nostrils when they're eating. Okay. So the picture on the left shows a patient who underwent a lower jaw surgery. So you can see the jaw is a little bit lopsided. And the second picture um, shows an example of trismus, which is a difficulty opening the mouth. So normal individuals should be able to fit three fingers between the upper and the lower teeth. Okay, so you can also try about three fingers. Um, but this patient here maybe can only fit about one and a half to maybe two fingers at, at most. Tumors in the throat, uh, or even at the back of the tongue, the base of the tongue, can cause one to have a problem with residue. So what does this mean? Okay. Uh, basically, after swallowing one or two times, uh, the individual may still feel that something is stuck in the throat. Okay. So the food and drink left behind is what we call residue. For normal people, one to two swallows per bolus uh, would usually suffice, even for things like sticky rice. But for someone with a base of tongue resection or throat um, resection, multiple swallows may be required. Sometimes um, the individual even needs to drink water to wash down the food in the throat. It can also complicate matters when the residue in the mouth and the throat falls into the airway accidentally causing choking or coughing. All these can lead to negative consequences. So swallowing may be inefficient and uncomfortable. Eating and drinking is also no longer uh, enjoyable for the individual. The individual can also be at risk of aspiration, which is uh, food and drink entering the airway and the lungs accidentally. Okay, so this can cause like coughing and choking during the meal. Um, and in some cases, it can cause pneumonia, which can be life-threatening if it's severe. So, what can we uh, as speech therapists uh, do for an individual with dysphagia or swallowing difficulty? So, these are some of our goals. If the patient had to be on tube feeding due to surgery or difficulty swallowing due to the cancer, we often aim to get them eating and drinking already again. And so, reduce or eliminate the need for the feeding tube. For some patients, this might take um, anything from one to two weeks after surgery. But for patients who have um, bigger or more complex surgeries, it can sometimes take months. If oral feeding is possible, we also aim to get our patients eating uh, as close to a normal diet as possible while ensuring they are eating and drinking safely and without too much difficulty. Above all, we are always thinking about the patient's quality of life. What personal goals and desires does the individual have and how can we work towards that? How is the dysphagia or the swallowing problem limiting the individual physically, emotionally, or socially? The truth is sometimes we may not uh, be able to achieve all of our goals. For example, some patients who undergo very extensive head and neck surgeries um, may have to rely on tube feeding for the rest of their lives as the swallowing difficulty may be very severe. In such cases, we discuss with our patients how we might still achieve some quality of life despite these physical limitations. We also journey with them, whether it's challenging them towards a goal or helping them move towards a greater level of acceptance of the limitations that they may face. The speech therapist is involved before, during, and after treatment. We do assessments of the oral structures, 
as well as the swallowing abilities. For individuals with dysphagia, sometimes we recommend thickened fluids, which could be safer or easier to swallow. So the picture that uh, you see at the bottom, right, the water, um, the three cups are, are showing increasing levels of thickness. So on the left, you see what we call level two fluids in the middle, level three, and the last one, level four. So level four is the thickest consistency that we use. We will also recommend a safe diet for the individual to consume. So this might be pureed diet at some point, uh, like the one in the picture, or sometimes we recommend uh, mince or chalk diet or even normal diet, depending on their abilities. As part of our assessment, there is also some problem solving and creative thinking involved. We get our patients to try different things to see how we can help them swallow better and more safely. For example, some patients may do better using a spoon instead of a cup for drinking, while some might be better on a straw instead of a spoon. We might also suggest uh, some uh, swallowing strategies or teach them how to control and swallow the bolus in a better way. Swallowing strategies involve some intentional movement or action to help the individual swallow better. For example, uh, sometimes we recommend this uh, uh, chin tuck posture. Okay, so it's basically looking down during the swallow or something like a hit turn. Okay, so uh, looking to the right side in this picture during the swallow in order to utilize the left-sided muscles more. So this might work for some patients, but it may not work for, for everyone. Rehabilitation also includes doing exercises and stretches. We aim to improve the strength, the range, and the stamina of the oral and pharyngeal structures. So this may include things like uh, tongue stretches here. Um, so either sticking out the tongue or using a gauze to pull the tongue. Um, we also do jaw stretches. Uh, so opening as wide as you can, or you, um, some of them also use a device to help them open the jaw, stretch it more. Um, and the last one here is an example of a swallow exercise. Can we call this the effortful swallow? So basically um, swallowing your saliva or swallowing a bolus with increased effort. Some individuals may also be suitable to have a prosthesis uh, made to help them swallow better. Okay, so this is just an example. Um, so we work with our colleagues uh, from the dental center um, to make these intraoral prosthesis with the intention of improving the patient's speech or swallow function. Okay. So this, this prosthesis here is called a palatal augmentation prosthesis and it's made for a patient who had a tongue surgery. So it's like a denture on the upper teeth um, and it lowers the height of the roof of the mouth. So in the picture on the right, right, you can see the prosthesis in purple. Uh, it helps because the tongue can more easily reach the roof of the mouth and then help in the oral phase of swallowing. Sometimes our patients uh, may need more comprehensive swallowing assessments because we don't have x-ray vision to really see what's happening in their throat. So we may send our patients for a scope. Okay, so the one on the left here is, uh, we call it FEES. Um, so a tiny camera is inserted via the nose uh, to visualize the throat and the vocal force. This is one of the assessments. The other assessment that we often do is uh, called a VFS or what we call swallow x-ray, okay? So during both of these assessments, the patients will be swallowing different things and we observe their swallowing abilities and assess um, where the bolus goes, you know? Uh, is it swallowed well or does it remain in the mouth and the throat? Or does it enter the airway resulting in aspiration? Or does it actually move into the esophagus like it should, okay? So doing such assessments can further guide our intervention and our rehabilitation planning. Okay, so now we'll be talking a little bit about radiotherapy treatment because uh, many of our cancer patients actually undergo radiotherapy as part of their treatment, whether it's the only treatment or whether it's um, to be done after surgery. So this involves receiving radiation to kill the cancer left in the body. But unfortunately, uh, radiotherapy does come with uh, short-term and long-term side effects for swallowing and communication. So these are some of the short-term effects uh, that somebody might experience when they're undergoing radiotherapy. So the first one is called mucositis or soreness and inflammation of the mucosa or the tissues in the mouth and the throat. So it's like having many painful ulcers. Uh, if you've had an ulcer before, you will know how painful it is to eat and drink. Um, so many of our patients will say that they have a lot of pain on swallowing. We call this odinophagia. 
So in this case, you know, we might advise our patients to avoid spicy food or foods with very strong flavors during their radiotherapy treatment. Uh, we may also um, get them to just eat a softer, more uh, easy to swallow diet, something that doesn't require so much chewing. Dry mouth or xerostomia is another very common side effect. In the picture, you can see that the tongue looks very dry and very cracked. Uh, saliva may also change, you know, not so watery, it becomes very thick and very sticky. So in these cases, we might recommend um, that uh, the patient uses a moisturizing mouthwash uh, regularly and also eat uh, some wet foods, uh, meaning like porridge or soupy things. Try to avoid dry and sticky food, which will be really difficult to swallow. Individuals also report taste changes. So food and drink have a very weird taste. For example, things that used to be very sweet would become very bitter, or food can just lose um, all taste entirely. Some patients even uh, report like tasting something very metallic when they eat. So sometimes we suggest that they use plastic cutlery instead of metal cutlery just to alleviate the problem a bit. Radiotherapy also results in um, general lethargy, uh, poor appetite, and consequently loss of weight. So after um, the weeks of radiotherapy, you know, the soreness, inflammation, and mucositis will usually slowly resolve and taste will also come back. However, there may be other long-term side effects which, which could kick in um, months to even years later. So the first one, fibrosis, uh, means stiffening of muscles. So muscles are no longer as flexible and don't move as well as they used to. So some of the areas will be like the neck, uh, so neck stiffness, tongue stiffness, and also jaw, uh, jaw stiffness, okay, which is what we call trismus. So just now I showed you a picture of trismus, and here is an even more severe case of trismus. So you can imagine that this patient, right, um, will find it very difficult to even fit a spoon into his mouth. Okay, so sometimes it can be it can be so uh, small the opening. Uh, the dry mouth or the xerostomia, unfortunately, is one of those side effects that can persist uh, for years after radiotherapy. A more complex complication of radiotherapy treatment is what we call cranial nerve neuropathy, where nerves may be gradually damaged and lead to some weakening of the muscles. So for example here, uh, we have a patient with a tongue weakness or a cranial nerve 12 issue. So cranial nerve 12 um, innervates the tongue, okay, so controls its movement. You can see that uh, the right side of the tongue looks smaller than the left side. And you can also see that there is, seems to be some shivering or tremoring of the tongue. Okay, so this is what we call um, like fasciculations. All right. So some people actually describe it as like as if there are little worms underneath the tongue, but it's actually um, a nerve issue that causes these uh, shivers. All right. So getting through treatment uh, can be really tough, and dealing with the after effects uh, can be very difficult for many individuals. Speech therapists always uh, encourage our patients to try to maintain their swallow function by doing two things, which is to continue swallowing and to do exercises. During treatment, even when our patients may have reduced appetite or find it quite difficult to eat and drink due to pain or lethargy, we still try to encourage them to eat and drink if they can, even if it's just a little bit. If they can do their swallowing exercises, it would be even better. Research has shown that continually swallowing and doing exercises yield the best outcomes for swallowing in patients undergoing treatment for head and neck cancer. And part of our work is finding ways to make this possible while motivating and encouraging our patients on in their journey. And basically, the idea is use it or lose it. Now that we've talked a lot about swallowing, we will talk a little bit about communication. So post-surgery, patients are often unable to speak due to the swelling and the pain after the operation. So speech therapists help with early communication by finding out the best ways for patients to express their needs, whether it's through writing, gesturing, or pointing. It can be as simple as providing a clipboard with paper and a pen for writing. The device here in the middle is called a boogie board. So you can write on it, and with the press of a button, the screen will clear and then you can write again. And the one on the right here is a simple picture chart uh, that patients can point to. Okay, so even if uh, some of our patients may not read uh, or write um, well, they can certainly um, recognize pictures. 
Speech therapy itself involves finding ways to help the individual speak more clearly. Okay, so imagine uh, having a tongue surgery. Okay, so in this case, you know, a resection of about half the tongue with a new muscle flap here, a flap sewn in. So naturally, you can imagine that this tongue is not going to be as mobile or as flexible as before. Okay, it will not easily curve or it will not easily flatten to make certain sounds clearly. Okay, so some of the sounds when they talk may sound a bit muffled or what we call imprecise. And some of the common sounds that uh, some of our patients struggle with are like the S, the S sound, or sh, or even the L sound, which requires the tongue to move up and down quite quickly. So in speech therapy, we work on articulation or pronunciation, teaching the individual how to position the tongue, the jaw, and the teeth in order to create a clearer sound. So um, part of articulation drills, right, uh, is repeating the sound over and over and over again and then practicing that sound in syllables, in words, in phrases, and eventually conversation. Uh, it takes a lot of hard work and practice, but we just want to help to increase the intelligibility or the clarity of their speech. Uh, we also teach uh, simple uh, speech strategies for clearer speech, like uh, speaking more slowly or over-articulating, exaggerating the mouth movements for speech. Okay, so in today's uh, short sharing, I've spoken about what uh, some of the things that we do as speech therapists. Okay, and there's really a lot more that uh, I can't cover um, today in the presentation. But if you are somebody who has speech or swallowing difficulties arising from you know, your cancer treatment or even any other um, condition that you may have, you know, uh, or you know somebody else who, who has a swallowing difficulty or speech difficulty, you can reach out for help. Okay, so you can inform your doctor and get a referral to speech therapy and we'll be really happy to help you. And with that, I end uh, my sharing and thank you for your kind attention. And I hope that this uh, World Head and Neck Cancer Day has been a meaningful one for you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alberta, for your presentation. Very instructional. Um, we have uh, come to the conclusion of the three presentations by our specialists. Uh, the last segment uh, before we end for the day would be the Q&A session. And you all have been, many of the participants have been submitting questions to us. We will do our best to answer uh, many, but we may not be able to answer all of them specifically. However, our experts will combine the answers such as to cover as much ground as possible. And uh, we will keep choosing those questions. Hopefully you can get uh, most of your questions answered uh, during this session. So maybe we can uh, start by uh, showing some of the first questions. I think this first one maybe uh, will direct to Dr. Rahul to sort of review one, once again, um, what are some of the risk factors uh, for uh, getting oral cancer? Hi, thank you, Mon. Um, generally, the risk factors for cancers are modifiable risk factors and the non-modifiable risk factors. Modifiable risk factors are like what we mentioned earlier, things like smoking, drinking alcohol, eating spices. So spices are not what you use in your regular cooking, like chili, et cetera. It's spices, um, it's a mnemonic. That, that's why we use the term quite loosely, but it's for things like be, uh, spices that they mix in uh, betel nut chewing or when they eat betel leaves, especially in countries like Myanmar or Taiwan, or even in the Indian subcontinent. Uh, having sharp teeth or sharp, or things that cause chronic irritation or chronic ulceration in the oral cavity or having infections, long-term infections, which cause chronic inflammation. These are modifiable risk factors, meaning you can treat them and you can reduce your risk of getting cancers. There are some non-modifiable risk factors like um, previous uh, history of cancer or family history of cancer. However, you should bear in mind that these are very rare and um, the chances of getting cancers from these kind of conditions is not high. So, do, do take care of trying to modify your lifestyle factors and that will help to reduce the risk of your oral cancer. Right, so Rahul, you mentioned that um, injury or recurrent irritation of the oral mucosa, including the tongue is one of the risk factors. How about eating very hot in terms of temperature food? Is this also a risk factor? Yeah. Hot in itself is not a risk factor, but if you're eating piping hot food that's causing injury to your oral mucosa to the mouth, you get blisters from it, or you get um, inflammation from it, then that kind of chronic insult or chronic injury to your mucosa 
can possibly um, cause certain lesions, dysplastic lesions that can eventually turn into cancer. And um, spicy food again, um, there are some spices that are not directly linked and others maybe. Any specific sort of spices or any specific things that people consume that is a known risk factor? So certain preservatives, food and uh, some preservatives that we find in food, um, if they don't meet the healthcare standards, um, spices that like this uh, lime that they, uh, people mix in this Indian subcontinent to eat with tobacco or betel nut, uh, those uh, uh, those uh, paste of limes or there are certain um, substandard chemical uh, chemically enhanced uh, preservatives and flavorings that are added um, in some substances, those can increase your risk of cancer. Uh, thank you. Um, so can the speech ability be affected before and after surgery or treatment for cancer? Uh, perhaps uh, we get uh, Alberta to answer that one. Yeah. Okay. So um, speech can be affected uh, even before the surgery. Okay. And it really uh, usually depends also on the size of the tumor. So of course, if the tumor is very large, like for example, a tumor on the tongue, uh, already your tongue is not going to be able to move well. Um, and there will also be some pain, you know. Um, so sometimes we have patients who say, oh, the, the tongue ulcer is rubbing against their teeth when they're talking or when they're chewing. So... Um, already the speech can be a bit unclear. They may not be so uh, keen to talk even. And of course, after surgery or treatment, um, if uh, the resection involves, uh, example, the tongue or even the jaw, um, then the movement will not be as good as before. Uh, so there may be some lack of clarity or reduced intelligibility um, after treatment. Yeah, so the answer is yes, it can be affected before and after, but usually depending on where the tumor is and how big it is. Okay, let's say uh, somebody is worried about having some suspicious lesion in the mouth and they're worried about oral cancer. How soon should they come to see a doctor and whom should they see? And then if it isn't cancer in the end, what are the chances of the oral cancer coming back having already had one in the past? Hi, maybe I'll take that question. Um, so generally, if you see something that is suspicious or that's worrying you and it doesn't get better in one to two weeks time. It gets progressively bigger or it, you have bleeding from your oral cavity, or it gets more and more painful. Then I think you should see uh, your doctor. It could be anyone, your primary GP who can assess or if you go to a dentist, you can get the dentist to assess oral cavity lesions. Um, and subsequently, if they think that it is something serious, they will appropriately refer you to head and neck cancer specialist so that we can assess and see whether you have cancer. Um, what are the chances of oral cancer recurring? Um, it's a bit difficult to say because it really depends on what type of cancer you had initially and how, um, how was it treated, how big that cancer was, uh, what was the status after treatment. Um, so there, there are multiple factors after that. Uh, obviously certain factors don't help um, with the chance of recurrence is, if after your cancer, if, you're one, if you had one episode of cancer, but you still continue the same lifestyle habits, like continue drinking heavily or smoking heavily, then of course your chances of uh, cancer recurrence increases quite significantly. Oh yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, so we have, you covered about taking the flap from an, uh, the person's leg or another part of the body to cover the defect in the oral cavity or, or the mouth. Can we use a flap from another person's body, like a transplant? Yeah, so uh, thanks for the question. Actually, quite a few of my patients and their family members offer, can doctor can take my flap, uh, flap of my body instead of my elderly father, elderly mother's uh, body? So unfortunately, the answer is no. Um, because uh, while technically, in terms of how we do the surgery, it obviously can be done. But the problem is you cannot take tissues and flesh uh, from other people, it, uh, just 
easily like that. It's uh, similar to say an organ transplant where you need to make sure that the person is a suitable donor first and foremost. And not only that, after any organ transplant, the patients will need to be on certain medications that we call immunosuppressants. That means these are medicines that help to suppress and weaken the immune system so that our immune system do not reject the organ. So can we do something similar in reconstructive surgery? Yes, as I said, the surgery can be done. It can be performed. Uh, can the patient be on immunosuppressants to reduce the risk of rejection of the flap? Can but we cannot put patients on immunosuppressants if they have cancer because they will cause the cancer to flare out of control. So immunosuppression is an absolute contraindication uh, in uh, cases of cancer, So which is why, unfortunately, taking flat from another person is not absolutely not an option. We have to take it from the patient's own body. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so uh, this one is a big question. Again, it asks about um, after seeing all these pictures that appear very scary, and indeed they are, how can we present, uh, prevent oral cancer in the first place? And um, how can we check? Can we check ourselves or do we need to go and see a dentist or any other specialist? What is the best way to sort of keep a, keep a, keep a tabs on uh, ourselves developing any suspicious lesion that may become cancerous? No? Yeah. Hi, thanks for this question. So as I said, um, the ways to prevent uh, oral cancer, or at least reduce the risk of getting oral cancer, is to reduce your modifiable risk factors, which is smoking, drinking alcohol, ensuring that you have good oral hygiene, that you don't get recurrent infections, um, abstaining from uh, having betel nut or tobacco or betel uh, leaf. Uh, usually you should get a checkup uh, at least every six months, and this could be from your GP, or if you go to a dentist regularly from your dentist or your oral hygienist. Um, and they're quite, in fact, quite a lot of our um, patients who have oral cancers are picked up by our colleagues at primary care setting level, and then they refer the patients to us. Uh, how often, as I said, usually about six months, every six months at least is a good timeline um, to get checked. How about self-checkup? Can we do it ourselves? Is there any tips or tricks that we can do in the mirror to uh, inspect our own oral cavity? Yeah, um, you, you can, and you should every, uh, every week at least when you brush your teeth and all have a good look inside your oral cavity. The problem with um, sometimes with oral cavities, it's a very complex structure and certain areas uh, require aid of special equipment or special dental mirrors or um, scopes to, to examine and to find if there's any cancer over there. So certain areas might be difficult for you to check by yourself at home, but at least whatever is quite visible, uh, it's a good idea to keep an eye on those areas and you know your body best. So if you do see something that is changing or that has uh, been progressively looking different from what it was previously, you would be able to better highlight it to your physician or to your dentist that this is the area of concern so they can assess it properly. So although you may not be able to see all of the oral cavity in the throat, if you do see something that's suspicious and that's not going away after about two to three weeks, that is hardened, that is bleeding, that is persistently ulcerated, do not ignore it and try to seek specialist opinions such that we can pick it up early and offer appropriate treatment. Yep, that's right. Next question. So sorry to interrupt, but uh, can I please uh, get the participants, if you have questions to, you'd like to be answered, can you please uh, submit it through the Q&A tab rather than the chat tab? Because it's difficult for us to keep track of the questions that is not in the Q&A tab. Yeah. Uh, so I, there are some people who have submitted questions in the chat. Can, you, can I trouble you to please submit them through the Q&A tab and we'll answer them there? Thank you. Okay. Um, some question about plastic surgery. Is it covered by insurance? And specifically, how about laser treatment? Is it covered by our medicine or insurance? Okay, Ken. Yeah, so everybody hear the term plastic surgery. The thing is cosmetic surgery and it's not covered by insurance. Okay, so first and foremost, um, to break up this answer into two sections, in terms of the reconstructive surgery, that one is actually not under cosmetic. Okay, uh, I'm not sure how many of you are aware, but in Singapore, medical treatment is split into two big categories. One is a medical indication and the other is cosmetic indication. 
Cosmetic indications means that you, are, you will not receive uh, government subsidies, you will be a private patient, many insurance uh, policies will not cover such procedures as well. But if it's under medical, then you'll be a subsidized patient. If you choose to be, uh, you can claim via uh, claim your uh, deduct your fees from Medisafe uh, and things like that. And insurance uh, policies usually do cover uh, medical, uh, medical treatments. So the initial reconstructive surgery is entirely medical. So it should be covered by your insurance policy. Although I always say that insurance policies, I always tell patients, you have to please check with your insurance agent because every person's, uh, everybody's policies may be a little bit different. Okay, but always check. But generally speaking, medical conditions shouldn't have a problem being covered by insurance policies and it would definitely uh, be uh, under government subsidies and can be claimed by Medisafe. Now, the second part, when you mentioned about laser treatment, right? Okay, so the things that I mentioned that we do for patients after surgery, things like your lasers, fillers, Botox, okay? Not everything will be covered under government subsidy, Medisafe, or, and also by insurance company. Um, but uh, for example, things like um, laser treatment, okay, in SGH, uh, we have managed to get this specific uh, way of charging patients uh, that still makes it fall under medical rather than cosmetic. So in that sense, uh, you can claim laser treatment uh, for Medisafe, but only for post-surgery scars. So if you come to see us for laser treatment for improving facial complexion, all these things, it will not be covered. Um, as to whether your insurance policy covers it, again, always check with your own insurance uh, policy and with your insur insurance agent. I hope that answers the question. Uh, Uh, can tongue exercise help in prevention? I suppose this is in prevention of speech disability or swallowing disability, uh, probably following cancer surgery. I'll have Alberta address this question for us. Okay, yeah, so, so I assume this is also referring to the prevention of the side effects of uh, treatment. So yes, tongue exercise will help. Uh, and we usually start very early. Um, at the time uh, when patients are ready to start exercises, we already do them. And we encourage um, them to do every day. Lah. So this will really help with um, battling the side effects of fibrosis or stiffness, if you remember. And also um, in abilities like speech, you know, doing the speech exercises will help in preventing it from uh, getting stiffer or the speech becoming less clear or the swallowing being affected even more. So um, yes, tight exercise will really help and doing them daily will be really useful. Dr. Arhun, you're muted. Oh, sorry. Um, can you hear me now? Okay, right. So will there be relapse after different types of cancer surgery? What about heavy stage for smoker? Will it be worse if it's discovered late? Um, again, relapse depends on when the cancer was picked up or when it was detected. Early stages of cancer that are adequately treated have very low rates of recurrences or relapse. Of course, advanced stages of cancers um, have higher rate of recurrence. This can be worse off if you can continue having, um, having high levels of alcohol or smoking um, that can probably add to the risk of re uh, recurrence again. And it may not recur in the same area. It, you might get cancer in other parts or other areas of your head and neck. Um, yes, as the disease is discovered late, it is usually in an advanced stage and requires multiple approaches to treat it. Um, and uh, the, the rate of cure can still be quite good if it is still manageable with surgery or other modalities of treatment. But as, in, uh, as the stages or as the um, disease progresses, the chance of cure or five-year survival drops significantly. Is watermelon frost spray good for mouth ulcers better than Bongella? Uh, with this kind of traditional medications like watermelon frost, we don't have any long-term data that supports or uh, gives us advice uh, or guidance as to whether they are safe or not. And also when they are unregulated uh, medications, over-the-counter medications, sometimes we don't know what different brands or different companies have added to it or what preservatives are there in it. And 
in that case, it may be difficult for us to answer or give you a comment on the safety profile of these kind of medications. Oh yeah, so the reconstructive as well as the uh, ablative or resectional surgery can look very painful. How is the pain managed after surgery? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, it looks extensive, looks scary, looks uh, very, very painful, right? But um, actually, uh, most of our patients are quite comfortable after surgery. Um, how is the pain being managed? Of course, these patients will be on adequate painkillers. Uh, there are many methods by which we uh, give them the sufficient painkillers. Uh, some of them includes, for example, allowing the patients themselves to have a little bit of control, a little bit of say as to when they want to receive the painkillers, okay? Uh, we're not going into too much details, but I, I think I just want to reassure you that there are many methods that we can use to help to reduce the patient's discomfort because very importantly, in the period of time after the surgery, we want them to start recovering. We want them to start doing physiotherapy. We want them to start doing rehabilitation, get out of the bed and move about. Um, and they can't possibly do all these if they are uh, in too much pain, right? So obviously, rest assured that we will definitely keep our patients very as comfortable as they can be so that they can go on to do all, do all these uh, rehabilitative uh, exercises and treatment. Yeah. Um, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Oh, another question. How long does the whole process take for reconstruction? Uh, of course, it really depends on how big the wound is, how complicated the wound is, uh, whether during surgery, were there any complications, for example. But by and large, on average, probably it takes around 10 to 12 hours uh, for the surgery. Okay, it sounds like a terribly long time, very scary. Yes, it is. But I also always want to reassure my Every time I tell patients this duration, they get a bit scared. And I always reassure them by saying that um, long surgery, of course, does have an effect on the patient. But uh, a lot of them, they're worried that long surgery, major surgery is the kind of surgery means that, like you see in the movies, they get wheeled into the operating theater and then oh, doctors come and say a patient never woke up from surgery. It doesn't quite happen like that in real life. Uh, um, our surgery takes a long time because it involves a lot of fine and detailed work. It's not the kind of major surgery where if things goes wrong, the patient can lose their life during the surgery is usually not, not that kind. So surgery takes a long time, but um, again, most of our patients, they will be okay uh, after the surgery. And also because they are screened uh, and they are uh, checked properly by an anesthetist before the surgery to make sure that everything is good to go before they actually go for the surgery. So um, don't, yeah, most of our patients will be okay after, uh, even after such a long surgery. And so don't be scared of the duration of the surgery. Yeah. So we have a patient who's experiencing slurred speech after receiving radiotherapy seven years prior. Is it expected? Is it normal and would speech therapy help? Okay, so um, slurred speech seven years after radiotherapy, that it's uh, possibly one of the side effects. Uh, as mentioned before, you know, the tongue is no longer as mobile, it's more stiff. Um, and I guess the question is, you know, even after seven years, um, can we still do something? And the question is yes. Um, although some of the changes, uh, you know, some of these side effects, they may have a component where it's irreversible because um, we can't really um, do anything to reverse um, the stiffness that uh, you, you currently have. But uh, speech therapy can help with um, still doing simple exercises for maintenance, but also uh, boosting the function. Uh, so how can we use uh, some of these speech strategies in our conversations so that even though the speech might be a little bit slurred, um, we can make it clearer anyway. Yeah, so, so um, speech therapy can still help. Many patients have experienced this uh, biting of tongue and they have a tendency to bite the tongue or cheek sometimes. Um, they know that it may be a, a risk, they, they are wondering whether it may be a risk factor for developing oral cancer and whether they, it's it recommended to wear a mouth guard to prevent this trauma from biting the tongue or the cheek during eating or speaking. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, yes, chronic injury or chronic trauma is one of the uh, causes attributed for, uh, for getting oral cancers and sharp teeth or teeth biting repeatedly at certain areas can cause oral cancers in the long run. Um, and these patients, they should first get checked whether they have crooked teeth or teeth that are not in proper alignment or sharp. If 
it's so they can get the alignment corrected or if the teeth edges are sharp, they can get them smoothened. Um, you can wear mouth guards. That can also help, especially some patients do it unconsciously. So they're not aware when they bite or they do it when they're asleep at night. And mouth guards help with that. Um, I would recommend that you don't buy over-the-counter mouth guards because they don't fit well. And if you have loose fitting mouth guards, it can cause other uh, issues. So uh, see your dentist or your orthodontist who can make a customized mouth guard for you. Um, so there's a speech, uh, there's a question about uh, prevention of taking an air after um, perhaps some reconstructive surgery or a person who has difficulty breathing and speaking properly or eating properly. Would a straw improve the eating and drinking? Okay, so um, I, I did mention before that for some patients, using a straw is going to be easier than using a cup or a spoon. But for some patients, you know, using a straw may cause them to choke a bit easier. Okay, so sometimes a straw does improve, uh, especially in drinking water, yeah, because... Um, uh, imagine if you had a tongue surgery, right? Um, it's difficult to cut the water that's in the mouth before you swallow it down. So sometimes when you use a straw, because you're using uh, the motion of sucking in the water, it kind of just flows faster to the back of the throat for you to swallow. So in this case, it bypasses the oral phase or oral cavity. So your tongue doesn't really need to do very much with the water uh, in order to swallow it. So some patients using a straw actually helps them more efficiently and more naturally take water. Okay, the question about uh, taking in air, um, to some extent, all of us do swallow a little bit of air sometimes, and um, consequently, you know, we burp or we belch. And that's, you know, also the phenomenon you see when you take a gassy drink, okay? So this is not very, very uh, abnormal, but if you are constantly belching or constantly burping, then this may also point to other issues like uh, gastro issues, and it would be best to um, talk to your doctor about it, especially if it's uh, affecting your quality of life. Um, there is a question about stages of cancer. Many of us have heard that there are, uh, you know, early stage, advanced stage, stage four cancers. How about oral cancer? Does it also go through these typical four stages? Yeah. Um... All cancers typically go, uh, have, go through the four stages. It's just how quickly they progress. Um, so generally the staging is decided or is, is um, uh, measured on whether the cancer, where it originated from, whether it's progressing and involving other neighboring structures or whether it has spread to other parts of the body. Um, unfortunately, in case of oral cancer, um, because it is close to such vital structures and different other parts of the um, organs that make up the oral cavity, it can progress from stage one to stage four quite quickly. So you could have a uh, small ulcer on your gum that would be early stage of uh, oral cancer, and that would be stage one. But once it invades the jawbone underlying the gums, it becomes a stage four cancer. So there are four stages, but uh, uh, you need to bear in mind that they can progress quite rapidly. That's why early detection and early cure um, is highly recommended. Thank you. And the question about um, oral sex specifically is the risk for development of oral cancer. Is this uh, a real concern and how serious is it? Uh, that's a good question. A lot of young patients do ask these uh, questions. So, um, Oral sex doesn't primarily raise the risk of oral cavity cancer. It is related to cancer of tonsils and the back of your tongue. That's the oropharyngeal area. And that is related to a virus called as the human papilloma virus. Thank you. Next question. Um, can oral cancer spread to other parts of the body, either initially or after the treatment of uh, the cancer in the oral cavity? Indeed. Um, so cancers can spread. That is one of the hallmarks of cancer that they spread to other parts of the body. Um, different cancers spread at different rates. And even within oral cancer, the early stages of cancers have lower chance of progression or spreading to other parts of the body. Um, typically oral cancers, uh, especially in advanced stages, spread from oral cavity to lymph nodes in the neck, 
from there on to the lungs and then to bones and other uh, major organs of the body. So say I had a uh, I had oral cancer and then um, require some voice reconstruction and voice rehabilitation. What is the best time to uh, work on the voice rehabilitation with the voice prosthesis following cancer surgery? Maybe you ask Alberta. Okay, so this uh, refers to patients uh, who had uh, laryngeal cancer and so removing the voice box. Okay, so of course with the removal of the voice box, there will no longer be a voice. So the voice prosthesis is uh, something that is put in to help uh, patients achieve something that's close to what they used to sound like. Okay, uh, in terms of the best time, um, to be very honest, uh, there are a lot of factors. So if the patient is suitable for it to be put in at the time of the first surgery, which is to remove the the cancer, then, you know, we call that primary insertion. Uh, and then for some patients will be suitable for that. For other patients, you know, maybe the surgery might be more complex. So they might have to consider it after. And that will be considered uh, only when all the treatment is finished and the patient is doing well, like uh, not in hospital again, you know, um, and ready to uh, commit to, to the voice prosthesis also because it does take a lot of maintenance and learning how to use it and how to maintain it well. Yeah, so, um, you know, this, this decision is made uh, not just by, by the medical professionals, but also with the patient, the doctors. So we kind of come together to make uh, this decision. Thank you. I saw, I saw another question in the Q&A, which is about uh, how, other ways to detect oral cancer. Are there specifically any blood tests that can be used to detect oral cancer? I think it's a good question. And I think we have come to uh, the end of our time. So perhaps this will be the last question we'll be addressing. Rahul, would you like to take this one? Is there any blood tests to detect oral cancer? Yeah, so currently, unlike some other cancers which can be detected using blood tests or um, using other bodily fluids. Currently, there are no tests that can detect cancer. A proper clinical examination is the best way to, to identify cancerous lesions. There are a lot of research ongoing, and in fact, it's one of my uh, research topic to try and see whether we can detect early cancers just using saliva or other bodily fluids. Uh, thank you, Rahul, for taking this uh, last question. And I also like to thank our panelists and our organizers. Uh, we have come to the conclusion of our session for today. Uh, it was indeed very comprehensive, and I hope everybody has benefited a lot. Uh, we've tried to answer as many questions as we can. Uh, if there are more, there are ways that you can contact us following this session and uh, seek further either answers or uh, communication or referrals such that you can come to the attention of a specialist that you would like to see. I will invite the panelists to make any last comments um, or closing remarks. And if not, we'll be closing our session thereafter. Thank you very much, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your weekend, please. Thank you.